I'm very happy to welcome you to the final public event of the semester. So we have had a lot of really wonderful programming throughout the year and we are ending on a very strong and important note with the conversation that we will have tonight. Um, before I introduce our two discussants, I want to offer some words of thanks to a variety of people whose work has made this event possible. Of course, always uh, the staff of the Barnard Center for Research on Women, and in particular, uh, Pam Phillips and Eve Kausch, both of whom um, do a lot of the work that makes all of our events possible. I also want to um, salute our student research assistants who are over here selling our wonderful um, swag, including Dare to Use the F Word t-shirts and tote bags, um, Tirza Anderson and M. He. Um, I also want to thank many of the people who work around Barnard to make all of our events possible, the events management office, public safety, IMATS AV, catering, and the facility staff who keep all of our spaces available to us. I also want to note that we have books for sale tonight from Word Up Community Bookshop, a volunteer-run community bookshop and art space in Washington Heights, and Gail is our intrepid volunteer tonight, so please come over and check out what's available there. Our conversation tonight um, involves two um, extremely productive, amazing, exhausting people. <laughs> I read their CVs and, and bios and think, my goodness, these people don't sleep. Um, an honored guest here from Canada, um, and so the Canadians in the room um, are happy to welcome you to New York, Robin Maynard, who is a Toronto-based writer and um, the author of a book um, whose cover you see here, Policing Black Lives, State Violence in Canada from Slavery to the Present. That book is available at, on the table. Um, this is an award-winning book. It's in its third printing. It was recently translated into French. Um, and it is um, a crucial study um, that uh, has been lauded by the Winni Winnipeg Free Press, for example, which wrote, every Canadian black, white, indigenous, or otherwise could benefit from reading Maynard's frank and thorough assessment of racism in Canada. And since this is a program about cross-border organizing, then I think every American in the room um, should also read this book in order to understand the dynamics of our neighbor to the north, um, which we sometimes idealize, especially at the current political moment in our own country. Um, not to say it isn't a wonderful country, but um, Maynard has published extensively writing in um, uh, the press and in various uh, scholarly journals, uh, and she has a long history of involvement in community activism and uh, advocacy. She's been part of grassroots movements against racial profiling, police violence, detention and deportation for over a decade, and has extensive work history in harm reduction-based service provision, serving sex workers, drug users, incarcerated women, and marginalized youth in Montreal. Recently, she helped develop the Black Indigenous Harm Reduction Alliance, a group of black and indigenous women and two-spirit people providing workshops to incarcerated women. She will be in conversation this evening with Andrea Ritchie, who is um, many, plays many roles, but here at Barnard is a researcher in residence at the Barnard Center for Research on Women, and she has dedicated um, years of her life to challenging um, all forms of abusive and d discriminatory policing against women, girls, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people of color. She's the author of several books, including Invisible No More, Police Violence Against Black Women and Women of Color, also available at the book table. Um, and prior to being affiliated with the BCRW, she has been a Soros Justice Fellow um, at the Open Society Foundation, um, and is currently at BCRW um, working with Mariam Kaba on a project that is interested in bringing together um, the work of research in the service of activism. And um, this is a project called Interrupting Criminalization, Research in Action. So tonight, Robin and Andrea will be in conversation around the theme, Resisting Gendered State Violence Across Turtle Island, Cross-Border Solidarity Against Anti-Blackness. I know this is going to be a generative and challenging conversation, and I hope that you will all join me in offering both Robin and Andrea a very warm welcome to the stage and to Barnard. Thank you. So thank you all for coming out, particularly at the end of the semester. I know it's um, 
it's challenging. There's a lot of competing demands on your time and energy, so it's really wonderful to see you all here and folks in the community. Um, and really cannot uh, commend to you enough this book. So I want to start, um, one, by welcoming Robin back to the stage. Um, she was um, actually, might, some of you might remember her from uh, the conference around Invisible No More that happened in November of 2017. Robin was one of the sort of keynote panelists along with Barbara Smith and Kimberly Crenshaw and Mariam Kaba um, and Raina Gossett, uh, sorry, who now goes by Tourmaline, who's also a researcher um, or an activist in residence here at um, Barnard. So it's a, it's a return visit, so mm -hmm. we're grateful to have you back, that you traveled back here. Um, so I just want to start by saying that as someone who was born and raised in Canada, for me the impact of this book has been really both profoundly political and deeply personal, particularly because, you know, you and I first met at this Cop Watch conference in Winnipeg, like, I don't know, 10 years ago, maybe yeah. more. Um, and we were both sort of two of the, oh, we're supposed to be using a mic apparently. Okay, we were both, um, we're basically the two people who were talking about policing issues through the lens of uh, gender and through the experiences of the folks that we worked with, people in the sex trade, people using drugs, people um, who were living, you know, street involved, folks who were being policed along the lines not only of race but also of gender and sexuality. And so um, it was really incredibly honoring to me that you would reach out sort of 10 years later and say, you know, will you read this book? And then I had the chance to read it with my mother who immigrated to Canada from Jamaica in 1960. And um, that was the same year that um, black folks got the right to vote in Canada. And most people in the US don't know that, right? And she also would tell stories of, you know, arriving in 1960 and being asked if people in Jamaica lived in trees by her coworkers and would sort of talk about these stories and I would hear from her and my brothers and other folks in my family who um, are certainly more black appearing than me their experiences of, of life in Canada, that my brother was involved in um, uh, uprisings in, in Montreal um, at the universities there, sort of around the time of the Black Power Movement and the very racist reactions of the police to those uprisings and, and of people in the community to those uprisings. And, but what the book did is I got to read it with my mom um, and it really enabled us to put her individual and often kind of isolated and silenced experiences of racism into kind of a larger historical Canadian structural and political context. I mean, she had it, she would talk about it, but she didn't know that those experiences, they're just, there's not a historical framework or, or space to talk about in Canada in the same way, and there's still this sort of myth of Canada as a place of open borders and multiculturalism and racial tolerance that was really directly contradicted by her own experience. And so for me to say, to be able to read for her, for, to her from the book was, um, just profoundly healing, I think, for both of us, and particularly for her to be able to sort of put that in a larger context and be like, oh, this is, this is part of Canada's history, not just my and my friends and my family's unfortunate experience of Canada. Mm -hmm. So I'm really grateful to you for really um, just beautifully and comprehensively and really conclusively laying bare once and for all the myth of Canada as a multicultural mosaic of multiracial harmony um, and of the benevolence of the welfare state also, which, um, is often sort of lifted up as what makes Canada, you know, one of the better places, a paragon of um, liberalism. And to really, and for really exposing the history of uh, the US um, and racism in state violence, or the history of Canada and the racism in state violence there um, as both unique and similar to the US. Um, at times kind of delivered more politely and with velvet gloves, but um, at other times with equal violence and uh, virulence and through every institution of Canadian society, through the police, but also through um, other mechanisms. And I'm also really grateful to you for doing it um, unapologetically through a black feminist lens. And for, that kind of explicitly names Canada's own brand of misogynoir, um, because, and not telling kind of a definitive story of state violence and racism in Canada through an exclusively male lens in the way that those histories continue to be told in America to this day in the US. And so I really am grateful to you for that. Um, and each time that I've moved from uh, Canada to the US, I've really been shocked at how 
deeply that mythology about Canada is bought here too, and have sort of found myself constantly um, sort of fighting against this myth of, of Canada as a place that doesn't have state violence or anti-black racism or police violence. And um, I had to sort of say, no, police shoot black people in Canada too. Let me tell you this story, let me tell you this story. And they beat people and, they, and so on. Um, so now I'm just grateful to you that there's a book that just conclusively debunks the myth of a slavery-free refuge to the north um, and as a place where people don't experience the kinds of state violence that we see here. And I can just shove your book and like slam it down on the table and be like, read this. I don't have to um, uh, sort of debunk that myself. So, and also that your book doesn't just um, sort of undo the erasure of the history of state violence in, in uh, against black folks in Canada, but also the history of res it lifts up the history of resistance, which is another thing that is erased here. That, that people don't know that there were black power uprisings in Canada. People are still surprised to hear that Black Lives Matter is as relevant um, and as active in in Canada as it is in the U.S. So, please um, help us uh, debunk those myths here tonight by sharing some of these unknown histories of anti-black state violence and resistance um, that you uh, outline in great detail and in beautifully written prose in Policing Black Lives. Well, first of all, thank you so much um, for your very gracious and generous reading of my book. You know, not only now, but you know, originally I'd actually reached out to Andrea to, to blurb the book when it, was first, when it was first being produced. So I just really wanna thank you again for um, really for bringing this, um, for, for really reading the work in such a generous way. And I also wanna just note that, you know, in particular that feminist lens, that approach to always looking at state violence from the way of never negating gender is very something that your work has been formative in in creating that new framework, right? So I just really wanted to flag that before, um, before getting into my own work and just to thank you for thank your you. work. Um, and I also wanted to thank um, Pamela Phillips, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Castelli, and Eve Couch for making, for making this event happen because I know the logistical work that comes to bringing a speaker and I just wanna say that I'm grateful. But to answer your question, Andrea, I think you're pointing to something that's really important, which is that not only is it that, you know, in the United States and more broadly, that Canada has this image of being sort of North Star, the end of the Underground Railroad, a safe haven for black people and refugees all throughout the world, but that is actually something that is also really part of the, the ideological training of growing up in the country of Canada. So part of what it means to grow up black there um, means to actually have your the history of your own community negated, the history of, um, even of the presence of black peoples in Canada as having been erased. And I use the word erased deliberately because my work, you know, very explicitly is engaging with the brilliant scholarship of Charmaine Nelson and Harmia Mani Whitfield and so many other black scholars, Winalda Walcott, who have been steadily interrupting this myth, this idea of Canada as a multicultural <laughs> state, um, only to again be written out of curriculum over and over, right? So we can't really look to this misunderstanding of of black life in Canada or of state violence against black life in Canada as a misunderstanding so much as a very deliberate and ongoing erasure. Um, and something that's, something that's very interesting about that erasure is that it actually dates back to, I mean, Canada, uh, slavery was practiced in Canada for 200 years. Of course, black people continually ran away, as you can see by looking to the archives of you know, the runaway slave advertisements. But if you look to Ontario school books, by 1860, only 30 years after slavery had been abolished in the, in the colony that then became Canada, it was already written out of the school books, right? So you can see, and it still is, right? So I've been speaking around Canada a lot since my book has come out, and usually it's about one in 100 people who have been actually taught the history of Canadian slavery in schools, whereas in the United, where we all learn about American slavery, we all learn about the American civil rights um, movement, for example, but Canadians don't know by and large that the last segregated school, for example, in Canada closed in 1983, even though we're educated around, of course, you Just know, segregated schooling in the United States. I was in high school and States. I didn't know that until I read your book. That's right. Um, so what my work was really trying to do was not only to really engage with that really important um, work looking to the history of slavery in Canada, but following you know, the works of Angela Davis and Saidiya Hartman looking at to how slavery has really continued to embed itself in so many institutions across Canadian society afterwards. So of course, within that study, we can see, you know, after slavery's abolition, actually the year after the first prison 
opened in Canada, and you can see the long-standing criminalization of black women in public space, the hypercriminalization of black men. But what's important to me is also really to create a feminist perspective of policing that actually, you know, that speaks to as well um, the policing, of course, of black enslaved women in their homes that translates very much to the ways that black women continue to be subject to surveillance and racialized and gendered punishment, for example, by child and welfare services, who, of course, you know, the police can't just come into your house without a warrant um, and search through your, your, your home and your things and, you know, potentially take your children away. But this is the kind of violence that's enacted on black women at extremely high rates in Canada that is, that is, not, often, that is not often addressed. So I wanted to address issues for example, like the, the really grossly disproportionate rates of, of police killings and incarceration, but I also wanted to look into thinking about policing and racialized surveillance in the places that we don't always look. Thinking about the relationship between the fact that the first enslaved black person in Canada was a child named Olivier Lejeune, renamed Olivier Lejeune, and how that relates to the six-year-old black girl who was placed in handcuffed um, and ankle cuffs in her school just in 2016. That there's a long history of viewing black children as property, um, as non-human, as, you know, as a danger to white children. So it was really important for me to really break past those myths that have been used as again, a kind of violence against us, right? When black communities are gathering, are trying to protest things like police violence, like racial profiling, and are continually told you know, by the media um, more broadly that this is an American issue that we're trying to sort of import something that's American. You know, even though you know, Black Lives Matter Toronto, for example, spent two weeks camped outside of the, uh, the police headquarters after the police killing of Andrew Loku, who was a Sudanese um, father of five. They also worked you know, enormously to get police out of schools and Toronto's largest uh, school board, which is something that is again, um, was always treated as if this was not an issue, even though the suspension and expulsion rates of black youth are astronomical. So it was just really important, I think, to break a certain kind of illegibility that made it such that the experience of state harm of black people and particularly black women, including black trans women and you know, also gender non-conforming people was totally un unseen and continually unseen. So, Andrea, I wanted to ask you a little bit about, about your work and the way that it's reframed policing in a crucial way. Um, it's uncovered, I think, some of the ways that the unknown histories of anti-black violence um, is, you know, as generations of black feminists have been arguing, but has never really made its way into the mainstream. Um, and I think what your work has really, has really broken that, right, to talk about how state violence is always gendered as much as it's racialized. We've spoken a lot about, just personally, about your experience organizing um, with black women against police violence in Toronto before you moved to the US. So I was wondering if you could describe what shaped your perspective on anti-black uh, state violence and resistance across the border. Yeah, I'm just, I'm really thinking about what you're saying, again, sort of reflecting back on my experience of reading this with my mom of how, at the same time as you're experiencing anti-black violence, you're, you've internalized this notion that it's better than the US, whatever it is, right? My mother tried to immigrate here three times and was turned down each time because she would show up and they'd be like, oh, you're black, oh no, you can't come here. Um, and, and then sort of mythologized being able to get into Canada, um, but then uh, kept experiencing this, this disconnect in the reality, right? And, and the systemic anti-blackness. So I'm just, I'm really thinking about what you're saying about how the experience of invisibilizing your own experience. And I think that that's doubly true for black women, right? Is in, when we're having this conversation about policing, um, black women are constantly similarly told that policing doesn't happen in the same ways to us while it's happening in the same ways to us and in also in these, in these other ways that you're talking about. So I'm just thinking about, um, as you were speaking about, just how powerful um, the invisibilization of state violence, even as you're experiencing it, um, how that's a uniquely Canadian experience and also a gendered experience. So, um, of police violence for black women. So I was um, in Toronto when Rodney King was um, beaten by LAPD and then when the not, well I wasn't there when he was beaten but I was there when the non-indictment came down. And many folks don't know, again, this is like the invisibility of black resistance, we turned up in Toronto, we were outraged. And in fact, it was the biggest um, protest in Canada's history. <laughs> Um, they call it the biggest riot in Canada's history, but we call it the biggest protest in Canada's history um, <coughs> the, the day that the non-indictment came down. And, you know, around the same time, a black um, Jamaican woman was standing uh, on a corner in Toronto at one in the morning, and cops walked up to her and said, um, 
basically you look like a drug dealer, prove to us you're not carrying drugs, and strip searched her in the middle of the street, like on the corner of Broadway and 116th, basically, at, at one in the morning, in full public view, while two bystanders were like, what are you doing? Stop this, this is you, stop it. And you know that struck me because she could have been any member of my family. Um, but what also struck me was that everyone was turning up, including myself and other black women in the community, for Rodney King, um, but nobody was turning up for Audrey Smith in the same way, to the same degree, and it wasn't part of the same conversation. And similarly, you know, as black folks were being shot in the US, black women were being shot in Toronto, black women were talking about both, um, but everyone else was only talking about the guys. And so, um, and then also it, it came through an invisibility um, also in the anti-violence movement. So I actually really came to start doing this work um, as an anti-violence activist. We were auditing the city of Toronto's um, responses to sexual violence um, as a result of a lawsuit that had been filed and won around their non-response or their very problematic response to sexual violence. And so we were involved in this sort of citywide audit of how they were responding to sexual violence. And then we're hearing from black women um, and women of color in the sex trades um, or who were being profiled around drug uh, charges that the police were in fact um, committing sexual violence. And so it, it was, again, sort of invisibility that we were fighting where we were sort of being told that policing was the, supposed to be the prevention of sexual violence or the response to sexual violence and our charge was to improve it when in fact police were the perpetrators of sexual violence. So I feel like there are many layers um, here. And then I, to, of this invisibility in the face of um, experienced realities. So when I came to the US, I found an even worse situation, I would say. I would say that I was spoiled by the fact that I was at least in a community with 10 black women who were talking about police violence against black women and that we had just done this whole sort of campaign around Audrey's strip search and around sexual violence by police and then came to the US and right around the time Amadou Diallo was shot and again, no one was talking about women's experiences even though Eleanor Bumpers had been shot up the block from here um, shortly, you know, four or five years before. and so. Um, felt like I kind of had to reboot and start and like kind of felt like that was a place where you know we're always told that um, the US is more advanced in terms of you know um, black liberation movements or black resistance and this was a moment where I was like oh no we at least talk about people of all genders up there <laughs> you all are still still stuck talking about um, through the, th uniquely through the male lens so um, I would say also that to the point that you were saying about um, the notion that Canadians import um, U.S. issues, what I, I came here to the U.S. to do research, basically. We were seeing things like mandatory minimums come across the border to us. We were seeing welfare reform come across the border to us. So comrades were like, well, if you're going to go to law school and you're going to go to the U.S., then go do reconnaissance and bring back for us what's coming down the pike and what the resistance strategies are. Um, so it's not that we're importing problems, that problems are being imported across the border, but it's not that we're making them up also. So I just wanted to pick that up from what you were saying. Um, so that's sort of how my work has crossed the borders. I think yours has also been crossing borders more and more, not just um, in terms of you coming to speak in the US and, and us being sort of in conversation on both sides of the border since both of our books came out, yeah. but more and more you're focusing your work on kind of continuities of violence across the border and also on the border itself that as it's not a site of liberation, right? Which I think is a trope that, you know, is, you know, the, the North Star of heaven is on the other side and your book so conclusively points out like what's on the other side is more of the same and people who might be trying to kick you back across the border. Um, but in 2016, that thing re-emerged, re right? Like, oh, the Canada is where I'm gonna go um, to escape this um, regime. And so I really appreciate how you've been lifting up the border as a site of violence. So tell us more sure. about that. Absolutely. I mean, I'm so glad you're bringing back some really important things just before I answer your question. Of, I'm, I was looking back to organizing done by black women in Toronto in the 1980s, and they had started this newspaper called Our Lives, Canada's first black women's newspaper, where you see many of these traces, right? These legacies you can find of black women addressing state violence um, and fighting state violence against black women, even though it's still cast aside, right? We see that people have been struggling to bring this 
you know, in ways that were, would be visible if anybody was looking, right, to bring this into legibility. And it's, again, like that, it's an action to, to make that uh, not understandable. And I mean, similarly, I think we can look to what I've been really thinking about in terms of like, what is the ideological function of a certain idea of the US-Canada border? Um, a lot more of my work recently has been thinking about anti-blackness and black freedom making in a more global and diasporic sense and thinking about how black people really transnationally are both facing you know, kinds of anti-blackness that are interrelated, and particularly in terms of kinds of state violence that we're fighting. So as you mentioned, um, the Canada-US border in particular has long been sort of instrumentalized by these competing empires in some ways, right? First by the British Empire, and now by the sort of ways that Canadian nationalism elevates a particular history, a particular historical narrative of the Underground Railroad to stand in for the meaning of, of the Canadian state itself. And I think that this is not to, of course, deny the very you know, real importance of the Underground Railroad to a particular era of black freedom struggle, but it is to say, what does it mean to focus on one particular historical moment to erase the kind of carceral continuities that we see sort of both before and after? So what is it, when we focus on the border as North Star, as a site of freedom, then like, what is that making? The question is, what is that making disappear, right? Um, Without it being complexified, it really allows Canada to present itself as this benevolent state that gives black people freedom, that saw injustice in the world and fought against it, even though we know, for example, that that has never been true, right? That this, in this particular moment, it was much more about, you know, the empire making a particular stand than Britain, who of course, you know, has one of the most, you know, deported, uh, I think two times more Africans than any other part, you know, than any other empire, right? That this was never something about benevolence. This was always about certain kinds of global control. So if we look to different histories of the US-Canada border, we see that besides that Underground Railroad narrative, for example, um, one thing that Canada likes to cite in its sort of Black History Month timeline on the website is this moment when um, the, the British brought loyalists, um, brought black loyalists and sort of free black loyalists from the United States into Canada in the 18th century, you know, this idea of bringing 3,500 black loyalists to, to Nova Scotia. But what is not talked about is the fact that while they were promised land, they were actually given almost nothing and many were near starving and working in conditions that historians have said was actually, you know, mirrored slavery. And again, what's also not brought up in this time of supposed black liberation um, is the fact that also 1,200 enslaved black people came as the property of white loyalists at this time. Right, so this is a history that's very much absent when we look to that as a kind of like Canada's liberation of these black so-called refugees. Um, we can also look to when American, um, you know, black Americans were fleeing, um, you know, the potential of state violence in Oklahoma and lynchings um, in 1911 and were trying to cross into the Prairie provinces. And not only what were Canadian border agents trying to do everything they could to deter this migration, including, um, you know, kind of searches that were compared to, you know, the slave auction block, right, that were completely degrading. But also, you know, Canadian cities ended up passing ordinances to actually ban black migration. There's a series of near lynchings. So again, a period when it looks as if, it's framed as if, you know, black Americans are fleeing to Canada to find um, freedom. We actually see something that's far less, far less like that, right? So I think what, ha what is happening again is, you know, in the last few years, Canada has seen a huge influx of black asylum seekers coming from the US into Canada, mostly black, right, largely Haitian and Nigerian in particular. And you see stories in McLean's magazine, in I think it was the New York Journal, New York Post, one of, the, one of New York's large magazines, um, calling Canada, you know, again, the new Underground Railroad for refugees. Um, you know, speaking to the fact that Trump is, of course, removing the temporary protected status for Haitians. But what was not, what is not reported is the fact that Canada actually removed that temporary protected status before the United States did and has already begun deporting Haitians. So what is not being reported is that Canada has actually, you know, sent um, a Haitian MP, Emmanuel Duborg, to tell Haitians not to come here. And that Canada is actually, at this moment, just yesterday, tabled a budget that would actually not allow black peoples to even cross uh, to who are crossing that border irregularly um, to make any claims. And I think we really need to remember that, you know, the U.S. Border, Canada border is also a grave. So I'm thinking about in late 2017, um, Mavis Otuteye, who was a 57-year-old Ghanaian grand grandmother, was found in a drainage ditch near a farmer's field in Minnesota, which is less than a kilometer away from Emerson, Manitoba, where she was trying to cross irregularly because Canada already has something called the Safe, Safe Third Country Agreement with the United States. That means that black people can't cross at regular points and then claim asylum. So what this means is that black people are fleeing in extremely dangerous conditions. Um, 
um, like Mavis Otuteye, who was laid to rest uh, nearby, as well as um, Sadie Mohammed and Razak Eyal, who were two Gana Ghanaian men who were fleeing persecution for their sexual identity status, who both lost, um, ha like had their hands disfigured because of the cold crossing into the border. So I think it's really important for us to remember that rather than continually reinvoking this kind of great idea of Canada as this liberator um, of freeing black people, that we need to understand that these anti-black hostilities are always collaborative and continuous, right, across the United States and Canada, whether that's supporting apartheid in South Africa or, you know, they actually orchestrated the coup d'etat, the 2004 coup d'etat uh, on Haiti um, in Canada, right? So that these are, even if one is sort of the junior partner to many of these violences against black people, that we really need to think, I think, more about the complicities. And this also enlarges the way that we can think about freedom, right? When we think about freedom as not just existing at the end of this, you know, sort of imaginary uh, border to this imaginary place where black peoples are free, it also opens up a different terrain of struggle. Um, so this is making me think again of your work. I know that you've been doing work, for example, with the Black uh, Alliance for Just Immigration, a recent report um, on, you know, asylum, what it means to have asylum for black girls and gender non-conforming people. Um, thinking about the police killing of Amadou Diallo that you had mentioned and the recent attempted deportation of 21 Savage, it's clear that it's not only black migrants, but black diasporic people more broadly are facing all kinds of state violence in the U.S., um, could you speak to how the experiences, I guess, from your perspective of black migrants here in this moment relate to what's happening with black migrants in Canada? Yeah, I was also thinking when you were talking about um, sort of the geopolitical role that Canada plays um, as, again, sort of like, like the U.S. goes and bombs places and then Canada goes and is, is the peacekeeper, right? But, but thinking about the Canadian army and kind of the violence it did when it went to Somalia yeah. um, and thinking sort of how Canada crosses borders to do violence elsewhere too in a way that we don't talk about. And again, the sort of, you know, mythology in my mother's, you know, history about like, well, Canada was the place that had open borders that would let me in, but then treated her, you know, like in, in a terrible way when she got there. Um, but I think that one thing that really struck me when I came here both times, but particularly the last time, is how without erasing the history of African descended people who, who were enslaved in Canada or who ran from slavery in the US, um, the majority of the black population in Canada is a migrant population. So when I was coming up politically, it was, you couldn't talk about mig migrant issues without talking about black issues. Like they weren't separated in the way that they are here. So I think I always did find it kind of shocking when I came here that we were talking about black folks and migrants as if we were two different people. And it's part of the reason that I always identify in my bio. I'm like, I'm a black lesbian immigrant, in part because it might not be immediately apparent when you look at me, and but all these things inform my, my work and my analysis and my identity, but also because I'm like, I'm black and I'm migrant. Like those, it feels important to say that as often as possible because it's so invisibilized in both migrant discourse and um, black liberation discourse. And so I think that's one thing that really sort of struck me um, when, I, when I've come here and have sort of keep fighting that. And so the report you mentioned was actually um, from the National Black Women's Justice Initiative. And it was right after the 2016 election, um, there was sort of this move to do campaigns for expanded sanctuary and freedom cities and how are we gonna protect migrant populations. And Monique Morris and I were like, hey, like when we're having this conversation, we're not gonna leave out black women and girls again and femmes, right? We are going to say that those conversations have to be about creating sanctuary for black women, girls, and femmes who like increasingly um, are black women migrants from the Caribbean, like my family, like many members of my family, are an increasing proportion of the black population in the United States, particularly black women migrants. And so, um, we were talking about particularly the need to attend to the intersection of um, criminalization and uh, for of black women, girls, and femmes and criminalization of migrants in the new administration because it's one of the number one tactics they're using in their anti-migrant agenda and to kind of make that a more prominent site of resistance so that we could <coughs> attend to not just what was happening at the borders but what was happening when ICE agents were like trolling the prenatal units at Brooklyn Hospital, right? Because they were trying to catch black women uh, migrants there. So we wanted to pay attention to that. Um, another way in which the difference between kind of migrant and non-black or non-migrant black populations plays out in the US and Canada is how we relate to settler colonialism. 
So I think I have very vivid memories um, of coming up in Toronto in the, in the 90s and these really heated debates around um, between indigenous women and black women in the national women's movement that I was part of at the time um, around black folks role in settler colonialism and black folks being like, but wait a minute, we're the fugitives of the ravages of colonialism in Caribbean states and we didn't come voluntarily to this continent either, so how are you holding us accountable and implicating us in the settler colonialism project? Um, and we had to come to very nuanced understandings of our relationships to each other and each other's histories of oppression and how they played out in our present and in our shared resistance that I didn't see when I got here. They drove me to be part of dialogues here between indigenous folks and black folks around reparations that started with like, well, Cherokees enslaved black folks. Well, Buffalo soldiers. Well, you all with the Redskins. Well, you all with the, you know, and it just, after there was some back and forth about that, then we could get to a place of talking about this, but I felt like that was a place that I brought learnings from Canada here to make that a more nuanced conversation. And one of the many things I appreciate about policing black lives is, um, I tried to do this in Invisible No More and was really um, excited to see you doing it so well in Policing Black Lives is acknowledging and being accountable to the violence of settler colonialism even as we're talking about anti-black racism um, and how do, we nav how do we feel like we need to do both at the same time and that we couldn't, it felt like neither of us could write a book that was exclusively about black folks without acknowledging that interplay. So say more about how you did that. Sure, and I mean, that's something that I think you also did really beautifully in your book was like attending to that lens because I think that not that I don't think that we can't talk about, you know, black people like on our own terms, but I think that if we're gonna be talking about something like state violence, right? Talking about how particular histories, particularly the aftermath of slavery is deeply embedded in the state, in all really aspects of the state. Um, it's really important for us to also look at how settler colonialism as well is completely structured into that state, right? So I'm thinking about you know, even though we don't have identical histories, of course, settler colonialism and genocide is a different kind of violence than that of chattel slavery, of that of being considered property. Um, it's very interesting that, I mean, my first experience this with, um, with these overlaps was working as a street-based outreach worker in Montreal for a long time and seeing that the same, perhaps for different logics historically, but the same people are getting beaten by the police. It's black and indigenous sex workers that are being, um, you know, sexually assaulted and not having, you know, not having anywhere to turn to because of a particular kind of degraded, de you know, societal kind of um, erasure that's happening, right? And if you look to, for example, the populations of Canadian prisons, you see that in some prairie provinces, you know, indigenous people, indigenous women are, I think, 70% of the prison population. So it seemed wrong to, or it seemed really important in talking about what state violence is and what it looks like to also talk about, I guess, sort of those intertwining histories and not leave, I think, an absence in terms of kinds of racialized violence that are very much living in the present, right? Given that settler colonialism is not done, is not, has not yet been overturned, just as you know, we have not yet fully emancipated ourselves as black people. And I mean, there's so much different scholarship about this at this time in terms of different intersections of black and indigenous people. But one of the things, there are two parts that resonate with me the most strongly. And one of them I think is, that's really important because it allows us to map different alternatives together, is thinking about the impossibility of citizenship for our respective communities. So um, I brought a quote by Norbisi, M. Norbisi Philip, um, who I think describes this impossibility, whether you're migrant or not migrant black person in the Americas, she's speaking to Canada, she says, these middle class black who moved to the suburbs, dressing and speaking like Canadians, driving the same cars Canadians did, discovered how much and how little they belonged when the police began shooting their young in the street like dogs. Having a house in the suburbs like all good Canadians aspire to was no protection, not if your child was black. And I think this really speaks to something in terms of where do our motivations lie and what are our aspirations in terms of freedom because we know that, you know, what is citizenship if it doesn't come with protection from harm and violence, if it doesn't protect black sex workers in Montreal or New York and it's not protecting Eric Garner or Andrew Loku, right? If our respective communities continue to be, um, regardless of the sort of formal promises of citizenship, always held outside of that. And I think what really overlaps too is that for indigenous communities, 
um, citizenship has also been weaponized, but in a different way, right? So writers um, like Audra Simpson have addressed how actually imposing citizenship on Indigenous women in particular was a kind of racialized and gendered violence to force them to, you know, to be sort of ejected from their communities and lose um, autonomy in a particular way. So if we think about how the settler state relies on this ongoing dispossession um, and sort of impossibility, respectively, of, of our communities, I think that also brings us to a to what it could mean to live together differently, right? So I've been writing about this a little bit, thinking about what it would mean to talk about black fugitive belonging, thinking about how we have been sort of collectively trying to flee racial violence and eke out spaces for life, whether within or across borders, you know, for half a millennia at this time, you know, really articulating that I think black people do have, you know, the we do have, for lack of a better word, I think the right to eke out a kind of space of belonging, but what does it also mean to, to think about what it means to be on stolen land and how do we fight for black freedom in a way that is not doing so on the unmarked graves of others, right? So I think that this idea of thinking of black fugitive belonging really asks us to think about since in particular we are never really not citizens of this place, what could it mean for us to think about justice differently? And this brings us to a sort of world building possibilities, right? Because I think that people think about things like decolonization or abolition as undoing projects. But I mean, as writers like Miriam Caba and Angela Davis have shown us, abolition is also about building a different kind of world. And decolonization, as you know, Leanne Simpson and others write, is also about this resurgence, right, of different communities finding different ways to live in this place. So one of the questions I have is, instead of trying to sort of think about equality within these violent states that never fully accept us, what if we thought about different ways of like creating a politic of solidarity on this place that didn't rely on the nation state, on the settler state. Um, so I do. Th I think it's necessary for us to think about a freedom as bound up in one another, and that's why for me, that's what really leads me to leads me to address these issues sometimes in par not quite parallel, but in proximity, in my work. Um, So Andrea, your work in Queer Injustice, as well as in Invisible No More, has been, has been paradigm shifting in a lot of these ways because it looks to how the policing of indigenous women and the policing of black women are often overlapping um, in ways that I find, as I think you point out, like don't always necessarily particularly get addressed in an American uh, framework. So I wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit about, I mean, your work, if, particularly in Invisible No More, really does some important um, sort of drawing these disparate histories of racialization and how that impacts indigenous and black women and girls today, and I wondered if you wanted to speak a little bit about that and about the importance of that from, from your end as well. Sure, I'm just finding myself um, with my mind uh, fully blown, as it so often is when I listen to you speak um, and when we are in conversation, and just thinking about everything that you just said um, being a possibility that is only created when we stop trying to claim a piece of a settler nation state. Um, and so I'm thinking about just all the possibilities that that creates when we're not in competition for a finite or scarce resource. Um, and when we are looking to the fertile ground of shared experiences, even when they are from completely different uh, structures and histories and legacies. So I think, for instance, often in the US, I'm sort of like, why aren't we doing more organizing about the ways in which indigenous women are profiled, um, policed, and violated by agents of the state in the context of the war on drugs, in the context of the policing of prostitution, in the context of the policing of pregnancy and motherhood, in which indigenous women's bodies, like black women's bodies, are considered inherently inviolable, inherently rapeable, and inherently polluted in some way, and inherently um, sexually deviant, and inherently um, deserving of obliteration, right? And um, there's so many ways that we could be building together, but I feel like we're still in a place of competition about which narrative is, is, takes precedence, the colonial narrative, the settler colonial narrative, or the anti-black narrative of chattel slavery. And I literally have the experience of having been in a group of people who were trying to write a statement that was about looking at the policing of black, indigenous, and other racialized women's bodies by the state who couldn't put the statement out because we couldn't resolve the question of whether to talk 
to say the word colonialism or chattel slavery first. And literally people were like, it's anti-black to not say chattel slavery first. And then we had indigenous people saying, but that chattel slavery was made possible by colonialism here and there. And literally again, having a moment where we couldn't resolve that tension instead of leaning into the fertile ground that that opens up. So I think um, it's, a, it's a fertile ground that we're just not cultivating enough and I, I really think it's also one in which we're in danger of carceral feminism um, claiming us if we don't find a way to, to build together around how um, the violence of the state fails us in, in every way, including um, in, in offering us any kind of safety and that we can elaborate these new radical visions, these new world-making possibilities by giving up on the notion that we want to claim a piece of this land or we want to claim we are owed some piece of this citizenship or we're owed some part of this settler colonial state. And, and I feel like there's something there that we have to lean into and figure out. So speaking of building across kind of unique histories and lived experiences, um, What's been really exciting about your book and our conversation and our travels to conferences together and your ongoing kind of engagement with US audiences around this book, and I'm really grateful to you for being willing to come across the border and talk here for all the reasons we've been talking about. Um, where do you see more openings um, for folks to step into transnational cross-border um, uh, solidarities, and like what do we call the possibilities um, on on Turtle Island, how do you see black folks being able to speak across this imaginary border about freedom and liberation on stolen land? Um, you know, what can we learn from each other? I know there's some folks, for instance, here in New York, went to Toronto a few weeks ago to learn how to get cops out of schools. And they seemed kind of surprised when they told me. They're like, we're going to Toronto. Did you know they got cops out of schools up there? Like, it was shocking to them that somehow in Canada, anti-black uh, liberation organizing would be ahead of US black liberation organizing, that they would be going to learn that way. What, po what other possibilities do you see for us to, to learn from each other? Absolutely, I was gonna bring that up actually. I also I actually did a training for that group <laughs> um, about, about the history of anti-blackness in Canada to help ground the work, but I think you know, as opposed to saying like which place did what first, I think it's more helpful to think about like how have we always been mm -hmm. working across this border, right? So I mean, that example I think is one that is particularly fruitful to say like whenever something works, how do we find a way to spread it there? So that conference was about how to talk about police free schools in a North American context, which is already like asking us what does it mean to think about abolition across borders mm -hmm. really and spreading the, you know, the ways in which we think about those ideas. And I'm thinking also too of uh, Black Lives Matter Toronto um, getting the police removed from the Pride Parade, which is something now we're beginning to see replicated in the United States. But of course, we're always like there's cross fertilizations, right? Like you talked about, um, you talked about sorry the Rodney King uh, uprisings in Toronto, and I'm also thinking about, for example, I mean, um, so many examples. Like there, I've been to countless you know vigils and demonstrations for. For example, Trayvon Martin, a friend of mine actually opens a really powerful spoken word piece, um, speaking to black liberation work globally, that she opens with, I woke up when they put Trayvon to sleep, because we all felt that as a kind of global violence against black people, as something that never resided in one place. Um, but thinking back to, you know, particularly this US cross-border solidarity, I spoke about the border as a grave, but I think it's also a site of struggle, and it always has been, so I'm thinking about you know, the works of Ronaldo Walcott and Alyssa Trotz, for example, show us that there's always been this long crisscrossing of the US-Canada border as a really important piece of this black Atlantic uh, life building, right? So for example, I'm thinking of um, between 1788 and 19, 1792, enslaved black people from the Maritimes actually fled to the northern states um, for freedom because at that time there was, uh, they were enslaved in the Maritimes and could find actually freedom in the US side of the border, which is kind of, you know, reversing some of the narrative of the US uh, of the, you know, of the underground border, under, underground railroad sort of freedom narrative. And, you know, while I'm sort of railing against a certain kind of theft of the underground, rail, underground railroad narrative by the state that makes it a gift from Britain as opposed to something that black people did, I think it's actually really important for us to remember that very important piece of black liberatory history when we have, you know, formerly enslaved black peoples from the Caribbean, 
from the United States and from Canada all really fighting on this, um, you know, on both sides of the border to free black peoples, at least if it was not a full freedom, it was at least a freedom from a particular articulation of brutal um, violence at that time, right? So I'm thinking of, you know, something that Sylvia Hamilton's research brings up, which is the case of this young black boy, uh, Sylvanus Damaris, who was uh, some slave catchers had tried to cross the border and steal him back and 150, um, largely black um, people who were part of a vigilance committee were actually fighting off, you know, fighting off slave catchers with bats, and then they were arrested by the Canadian, on the Canadian side, right? So you see a certain kind of, as you know, as I mentioned, this hostility on both sides of the border, but this is also a really important site of cross-border struggle that I think we don't think of because it's often been sort of co-opted uh, and became this sort of British gift to black people as opposed to a freedom that we made. Right? or something closer to freedom that we made. Um, I'm also thinking to, um, if you look to sort of surveillance, um, you know, state surveillance of black uh, Canadian activism in the 1960s and black American activism in the 1960s, uh, 60s, you see that they were afraid of what the black power activists that were working together, yes. often across the border, right? Yes. So Stokely Car Carmichael was working with Rocky Jones in Halifax. You see in the surveillance, um, in the surveillance documents that they thought that this posed an existential threat Right, so I think that that's again something, a certain kind, it represents a threat because it also represents, you know, a refusal to be bound by this particular border. And I think that um, it's really important for us to think about freedom that all, as always extending beyond those borders, as always sort of fighting the confines of those borders to try to create something, you know, in this, this place that we share, where of course that border is also, you know, an act of violence against indigenous communities, like it cuts the community of Akwesasane in half. And you know, you have, uh, you know, Mohawk women who've been arrested trying to, like, who've crossed the border illegally, right? So what does it mean? <laughs> of their own land, right? So what does it mean for us to really forego that and what that, the kinds of enclosures that that leaves us with and what is it, what does it make freedom possible? What makes, like, what is possible for freedom when we think about it as always having traversed those borders and continually doing that? Um, and how do we make that stronger, I think, is a different question um, because we've always been um, sort of eking out freedom at and across the border in different ways, and I think we'll continue to. So it's really about strengthening that. So the um, thing that, um, so when Robin spoke here last time, uh, there was a standing ovation. She just brought the house down. And that was not an easy thing to do when you're on a panel with Kimberly Crenshaw, Barbara Smith, Mariam Kaba, and Tourmaline. Um, but she, you did it around um, a vision that you articulated that brought together two of the things that you just talked about. Um, one was sort of us creating a freedom on top of and in spite of borders. Um, but you also did it by, with this concept that you talked about earlier of black fugitivity and tied that to the climate crisis and tied that to the anti-black nature and impacts of the climate crisis and the ways in which that is fueling migration again across the Atlantic um, and also across the Mediterranean and, and in ways in which uh, we now are being sort of dragged around the world, maybe not physically in chains in the same ways, but by the ways in which um, the same countries are producing a climate disaster that is pushing us around um, and pushing us into places where our labor, we're then having to be there in an undocumented way, to labor in a way that is unregulated and is abusive and violent. And um, so you took us not just across the Canadian-US border, but across all borders um, to present us with a vision of um, black liberation um, globally. Um, so if you can, can you recreate that for us in this moment no before we go to Q&A? <laughs> um, so, what you're, I mean, what you're asking, I think, is something that's very much inspiring the work that uh, the, my next book going forward, which is about thinking about the connection, like really black, thinking about black diasporic freedom in connection with all the ongoing, like very real kinds of imperial violence at the same time. So um, something that really started my mind thinking about this was Black Lives Matter um, in the United Kingdom in a few years ago stopped a flight um, to, um, a flight leaving the UK uh, stating a few things, stating that climate change is racist and saying that black people globally are first to die in the climate crisis, right? And that we need, there needs to be a way of addressing uh, the U United Kingdom's role in this, the global role in black people's displacement in the first place, particularly in the context where black people are continually being <laughs> deported, you know, from the UK in the hostile environment, right? And I think that that ties us to something that's very 
really important for us to note, right, that not only are we seeing this mass deportation of black, a huge amounts of black populations from Canada and the US, but we're actually seeing the largest rates of displacement you know, in, in, in centuries, right, outside of the Second World Wars, and particularly concentrated uh, coming out of, you know, the African continent in the Caribbean. And we're seeing also a particular, you know, the, the impacts of climate change are being particularly impacting um, the Caribbean as well as Sub-Saharan Africa. There's actually a book that just came out a few years ago, it's called To Cook a Continent by Nimi Mobassi that's talking particularly about how, you know, the ravages of racial capitalism in particular are harming and displacing black peoples from their homelands on an ever increasing scale, right? And this is something that is so not often talked about when we talk about black liberation and black freedom. So I think it was just really trying to remember that anti-blackness has always been a global violence, right? If we think about the massive theft of, you know, 10 to 15 million Africans from um, Africa, not only to the United States, but also to Brazil and to the Caribbean, that this kind of globalized violence is being reenacted again, even if those kinds of displacements are now for different reasons. So we often talk about racial capitalism in the US and the way that black people have been made disposable, have been incarcerated, but we also need to think about globally, you know, the price that black people have already paid for trying to make freedom in places like uh, Haiti, which had to pay massive reparations to the France government, or, you know, Grenada, which was invaded by the United States in 1983. And we need to remember that racial capitalism, even still today, and the control over black people's freedom is still global, right? So the wealth of US and Canada is not only produced by the enslavement of our ancestors here in the past, but it's also being made by, you know, things like AFRICOM, um, Canadian and US massive involvement in extraction in the Congo and all over the continent of, um, of Africa and the Caribbean that the kinds of wealth that we're seeing here are deliberately because not only of past injustice but of injustices towards black people right now. So when you talk about black life mattering, if we don't think about what that means on a global scale, we again end up within this kind of scary national trap that says I want a piece of this, this ongoing pillaging of our kin who are of course being displaced across those borders. So I think it's really important for us to continue to think, you know, as so many Caribbean feminists like Audre Lorde have come before and Claudia Jones and others, to always remember that globally our freedom as black people is bound up in one another's, and not because of some essential, like race, race essentialist sort of understanding, but because of the particular kinds of violence that have united us and continue to, to harm us really um, since, since slavery. But that also requires us, particularly those of us who are situated in the global north, I think gives us a particular responsibility to form our allegiances again, not with these nation states and the empire that is still continuing to, to displace you know, our relatives <laughs> um, in some cases, right? In Canada, which is like a nation where most black people are migrants, right? Our relatives <laughs> who are being harmed by this, but to choose instead our allegiances with black peoples globally. Um, so I think instead of really talking about what it would mean to equally inherit those spoils, we need to think about transformation and abolition, not just on a scale that talks about sort of equalizing things within these national economies, but what would it mean to actually su support those global transformations for, that would be required for black people to truly be, to be free. So. Thank you so much for writing a book that takes us beyond these borders, but also takes us to that possibility. We can't wait to read your next book. We can't wait to have you come back when it's there. But for now, I just want to ask you all to please give a huge round of applause to Robin Maynard for offering us this incredible vision of um, a cross turtle island, cross border solidarity against anti blackness across Turtle Island and beyond. So, we're going to open it up for questions. There are some uh, brilliant BCRW uh, research assistants who are going to play Oprah um, and come to you. Thank you so much to both of you. This was really great, and I'm really happy to be able to have this conversation about um, policing uh, on a um, multinational kind of cross border uh, perspective. Um, so, what I wanted to ask about was. Um, more about how to reconcile with Im immigration and um, anti-blackness in Canada and I guess as well as um, in America. Um, I think that as a, because of the uh, white colonial empire that we all live under, um, there's this insistence that um, there's a narrative, this anti-black narrative that immigrants um, that come from, not, not black immigrants, but uh, South Asian immigrants and other Asian immigrants and all over the world um, may kind of um, lean into this uh, anti-black narrative uh, because we belong to this um, colonial empire and we're immigrated um, into the settler colonial land. 
Um, and so how do we kind of reconcile with that and where do we, how do we use that, um, use this language and use this um, work to um, move the, the conversation forward in other immigrant communities? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in for one second, but I'm going to turn it over to you. And I'm also laughing because we are being very Canadian and apologizing to each other for being like, oh, no, you go for it. No, you, oh, I'm sorry, I spoke. Anyway, but um, I think, uh, I think all of us need to lean into um, the, to challenging the anti-blackness of narratives that talk about dichotomies between criminal migrants and non-criminal migrants. That's an anti-black narrative. That's a narrative about we are good, hardworking, um, we, you know, we've been paying taxes, we're good, we're hardworking, we've never gotten in trouble with the law. Those are the migrant, you know, that's our argument for citizenship. That's an anti-black argument for citizenship because it, it juxtaposes against a presumably criminalized um, presumably, you know, non-productive, non-contributing migrant, um, which is, you know, blackness is projected onto that. So I think that even within black communities, sometimes we participate in that anti-black narrative around migrants. Um, and so whether they are black migrants or non-black migrants. So I think that's my offering for that, but you, I'm sure, have. Yeah, I mean, I think what you're saying is just so important though, right? And this is something, I mean, Marta Escobar wrote about this in a piece called No One Is Criminal, um, where she was explicitly talking about this idea that, you know, there's often this way that different immigrant, different, different non-black immigrant communities are often sort of hailed to like make their claim on the state by saying like, but we are hardworking, not like the blacks, but we are not criminal. <laughs> like the not like the blacks is unspoken, but it's very much present, right? That. Um, uh, so there's often this distancing that comes, right, that says, this, particularly this idea that we're not, that crossing borders isn't illegal, but that, for, that sometimes, for more in more mainstream organizing, often absence the fact that also criminal, you know, the very idea of criminality is so much associated with blackness that it's not about committing crimes, but it's about attaching certain behaviors to a racial group and policing and punishing that racial group, right? And that's something that's often erased when we talk about, uh, you know, saying that we are not criminals, what that really is, um, sort of upholding is this notion that the criminalization of black people is then somehow like ethical and moral and that we really need to be challenging those two things at the same time. So what I really liked about your work in terms of what it means to say we need sanctuary too is I think it speaks to the fact that black immigrant and not and uh, not migrant communities need to have sanctuary from that ongoing harm of the criminal ju of the criminal justice system as well as we need to talk about migrants having um, black, black and not having a certain kind of um, sanctuary, right? What does that mean? I think it just, again, if we think about it, this in the context of abolition and reducing and eliminating the role of racialized punishment, again, I think it allows it to become a lot more clear. But I think it's always, it's often the easiest. Um, and, you know, a lot of, particularly in Canada, some of the most really intensive and anti, intensive, like anti-migrant things that have been passed in recent years have been justified by anti-blackness, right? So there was, like a shooting in Ontario in the 1990s uh, that was called the Just Dessert Shooting. That was an interracial shooting where um, a white woman was killed. Oh, yeah, a white woman was killed and it turned into this massive mediatized hysteria around Jamaican crime in Canada, which of course statistics bore out was not any particular, you know, was not a relevant issue, but it turned into this massive mediatized panic to the point that they actually created legislation that facilitated the deportation of, uh, of criminal, black migrants who'd committed crimes. And it was supposed to be dangerous crimes, but of course, as we know, the law was written such that people who had like had marijuana, you know, sold marijuana and things ended up being deported. And it was later described as a witch hunt where they actually mass deported huge amounts of, the, um, of Jamaican community members, many of whom had lived there for like almost their entire lives, right? And that was been able to be justified because of a certain idea around black crime that I think it would have been a lot more difficult to, had there not been such an easy scapegoat. So we need to remember that blackness is often sort of the grounds upon which other kinds of harm are justified by. So we don't only, not only need to do this because of our solidarity with black peoples, but also because we know that that net is first often cast around blackness, but it always ensnares further. We see this with the war on drugs, right? We see this with criminalization more broadly that it's not only black people being incarcerated, right? That it's, it justifies the harm on large swaths of the population. I think also particularly um, you know, I don't want to idealize conversations in Canada because we definitely <laughs> don't have a lot of conversations and are definitely ahead of the game um, in other places uh, in the U.S. But I do feel like there was also more conversation in Toronto because there was, we were just, we're, 
it's just the, the way in which we're forced together by being a smaller number, yeah. um, that we had to have conversations between black and South Asian communities in very real ways that were like, stop with the anti-blackness, but then also them being, stop with the anti-South Asian, like I grew up, you know, steeped in anti-South Asian um, racism everywhere. That was, that's like, it's in a way that's not as visible or talked about in the US. And so we all had to figure out how to stand in solidarity with each other um, instead of confront the ways in which we were participating in each other's oppression, um, even as it was organized around anti-blackness. So I feel like, um, I, would, I, I came here and was like surprised even, I, I went to Howard Law School and at some point we went out for some student affairs thing and someone took us to a South Asian restaurant and the non-migrant black students like didn't know what anything on the menu was and I was like, what, what, like y'all don't talk? Like we have to talk in Toronto. We have to have these difficult conversations about, um, about these issues and how, how we can ask South Asian folks to lean into to confronting anti-blackness um, in their migration journey um, because we have to do the activism together. So I think it's, I, I would really encourage us here in the US to do more um, conversation across groups um, that are real conversations, <laughs> um, that are hard conversations, but ones that I guess we figured out how to have. Yeah, something that, I'll, let, I'll let us go to the next question after this, but something that I saw as like an interesting, perhaps not, any, an interesting historical moment in like UK history is actually looking at how um, black and Asian solidarity was like a very particular part of a certain era of organizing and not entirely, right, but that there was kind of a particular articulation of those solidarities as always being anti-imperial and just part of a policy of really contesting empire, you know, um, violence against migrant communities more broadly, and I don't want to idealize it again because you look back to different historical narratives and realize that there was that solidarity was not perfect, and that there were many issues that you know and fundamentally have 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 since changed, right? But it does speak to a particular kind of what it meant to not necessarily collapse harms into one, but to look at the target together, which I think is you know an interesting way of thinking about solidarity, right? In terms of just what it means to 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 go against empire. Uh, while working together. Thank you so much for your um, comments and your um, insights. I really appreciate it. Um, hearing from two really powerful and um, impactful uh, women. Um, I speak kind of from a very lonely place because I'm a math teacher. And um, it's very rare sometimes Although we live in New York, and I think probably about 52% of the population in New York is women, but in the world in which I, I inhabit, I'm usually um, alone and unable to have these conversations, so, so thank you. Um, I, first, I wanted to share that um, I'm, off, I'm from Africa, so um, I've kind of experienced a lot of trauma um, I lived in Nebraska too before I came to New York and I just have to share this just because of what I had you guys say which is that when I lived in Nebraska it was 3% uh, uh, black population. It's a heavily, heavily um, white uh, population but 3% of the population was black. Um, I used to volunteer in the prisons. Uh, the main prison in Nebraska is in Lincoln, Lincoln Penitentiary. In Lincoln Penitentiary, which is even more uh, white, I lived in Omaha, Nebraska, which is the largest uh, city in, in, in uh, Nebraska. Lincoln, where the, the University of ne uh, Lincoln is, and it's a large university, and where the penitentiary is, it was, you could see like an ocean of black men. And you know, when you arrived there, um, me coming from Africa, I'd be like, oh my God, this looks like Africa. So I'll never forget because my mom died, but when she uh, came to visit me, um, I took her there. I was going to do some volunteer work, so I went with her. When we arrived, she was so shocked, she started crying uh, because it, was, it just made that much impact on her. That here we were in Nebraska. I lived in a sort of a suburb where I was kind of maybe one of few uh, black people who lived there. But I did a lot of traveling in Omaha where there are a lot of black people, but she had just never been to a place where you saw a sea of black men in Nebraska. So just in case you think 
that it's New York uh, State that has predominantly black men in, in prisons, in jail, try going to the Midwest, to Nebraska, and this is several years ago, I'm not gonna tell you how long, that, how long ago that was, because uh, then you'll start calculating my age. However, I, I'm not ashamed of my age. I just wanted, want you to know that these issues are still very relevant today, uh, even in the Midwest, even in the red states that, um, that most of us talk about. But, but what I wanted to talk about um, and, and, uh, and have you address today is that so much focus is put on policing um, by researchers, by the media, but there's so much violence that, that is um, experienced in other ways, um, especially in our institutions. And I wonder how much research is being done by you or your peers, could you point to it? Because I think about, about my experiences here, for instance, I'm a graduate of Columbia, and um, when I was going to school here, it was majorly oppressive. Um, like I said, I'm a math teacher, so you know, I, I kind of traveled the hallways of Columbia, and most people looked at me wondering what I was doing there, and they were very, very direct. Um, and I was in a cohort of, um, I was the only black person in my cohort, there were three of us blacks, and each of us was distributed in, in uh, the three cohorts, but nobody spoke to me. Nobody spoke to me. Um, there's a lot of trauma. So could you speak about how you or your colleagues um, speak to the larger, broader issues? I almost get annoyed when I, I, I hate to say that because I know you're doing very good and important work, um, but when you next have a session, could you have a, a little bit more dialogue on institutional violence? Is it being done? I worked in the corporate world, and I have to tell you another thing, I'll share this and then I'll sit down. I worked in the corporate world before I came to, to, became a teacher. Where I worked, usually it was us, black people in the corporate world where I worked in finance, were mostly immigrants. There was very little involvement in finance where I worked by indigenous, and for, what's the like, right language these days? enslaved blacks, children of, enslaved, of slavery. What's the right terminology? I don't know. So I kept asking my, my employers, all of us here, we're from Jamaica, I'm from Uganda, the other person is from Somalia. What happened to African Americans? There was little discussion about it. So I also would like you to please comment on women as perpetrators, immigrants as perpetrators, um, in terms of anti-black violence. First of all, thank you for sharing, um, for sharing your experience and you know everything that you've experienced as a black math teacher and just, uh, anyways, thank you just for bringing that into the room. Um, I'll try to address a few parts of your question. I mean, and I'll let you speak because you're doing, well, I'll let you speak about your own work, but um, what I would speak to is that, I mean, it was really important for me with policing black lives. Um, it was focused on the state, but I did, um, particularly because of the lack of awareness around so many other kinds of institutional violence in the country. Even though it's called Policing Black Lives, what I'm trying to do with that title was really to bridge a certain kind of racialized violence and punishment that happens across institutions. So there's one chapter, there's a few chapters on policing and incarceration, but there's also a chapter called um, Slavery's Afterlife in the Child Welfare System. There's also a chapter called The Miseducation of Black Youth. Um, and there's a chapter that focuses on the immigration system as well because I think it's really important for us to remember that, you know, Angela Davis says that slavery didn't, you know, didn't end, it was just re-embedded in, in, in new institutions, but we often only focus on the criminal justice system, as you pointed out, right? But I think it's really important for us uh, to always look at to all those other places that are often, you know, that we send our kids to public school, right? And we know the kinds of things that happen to our children in schools, right? That can be so horrific and terrifying. So it's really important for us to always think about these other kinds of locations. And that's something that your work does, I mean, very well and strongly in terms of what happens to black women when they're giving birth in hospitals. So I do think that, yeah, the idea of policing that you bring forward is again one that's like quite, quite theoretically and empirically rich and generous in that it covers a large swath. I don't know if you want to speak 
more about uh, that. I appreciate that. I do, I, I think that the focus on policing um, is because the police are literally the front lines of the things that you're experiencing um, in, in, a, in a corporate institution or an educational institution. Um, they're just the kind of most um, kind of brutal and um, sort of obvious manifestations of the same thing. And sometimes they come into those spaces, um, you know, like uh, people wouldn't speak to you in the hallway or questioned your right to be there. And then at Yale, someone, you know, took that to the next level by calling the police on a student at Yale who was having a nap in her own dorm room, right? So it's, it's a continuum, I think. And so because we're focusing on this end of the, the sort of most stark end of the continuum, does it, we are both in our work sort of tracing that back to the institutions, um, the institutional violence that the police are just the most obvious example of. Um, and one of the things that we're doing with the initiative that Professor Castelli was talking about at the Interrupting Criminalization Initiative um, that Mariam Kaba and Woods Irvin and I are working on is to talk about how policing has now invaded every institution of our society, such that even when the actual physical police aren't there, people are policing black bodies in those spaces. And, the ex and then, you know, as we all saw with Jasmine Headley, who was a black woman who went to a social service office and, you know, had the audacity to sit on the floor after being there for eight hours with her one-year-old, um, Sometimes the police come in literally to police those black bodies in those spaces, but um, it's all part of a continuum. So we are talking about all the institutions in which that policing is happening and showing that continuum. So we're trying to break out from the notion that it's, it's only police on the street that are the problem. And I think particularly when you look at issues through the lens of black women's experiences, as we both do, you get more quickly to seeing how policing happens in institutions, even if the actual police aren't there. Um, and then in terms of your, the last part of your question about the kind of participation of um, black women and black migrants in these projects of anti-blackness um, that we are building resistance to, um, I mean, I think that's a, a question particularly around some of the institutions that we're talking about, the child welfare institution, prisons, um, schools, health care providers, those are professions that are populated by black women who might be policing other black women <laughs> in those moments, right? And that we do need to find ways to sort of interrogate and challenge that. And the ways in which, um, as I was saying earlier, even within black migrant communities, we participate in anti-black narratives about non-black, non-migrant black folks. Um, and that some of that um, is something that we also have to challenge within our communities. So it's a, it, there are many continuums that we have to follow to their logical conclusions at all ends in order to get to the place that Robin is leading us to in black fugitivity. Um, I have a question. Well, I have three questions because as y'all talk more and more came up, so <laughs> bear with me. You don't have to answer all of them, so you can opt in and consent to what you want. Um, so the first thing I want to ask about is like, how do you hold and center colorism in the way that you talk about anti-blackness, knowing that like, Dark skinned folks do experience, dark skinned black folks experience um, higher rates of violence, higher rates of policing and incarceration and things like that um, as we're talking about anti blackness within, our, within or across our borders. Um, the second thing I would say is like um, also thinking about like across Turtle Island and then like thinking about diasporic black folks when we are building a solidarity, like even though like state violence happens in all of these country, like like the US or Canada aren't um, exempt of that, I do feel like sometimes, I feel like state repression looks differently in different countries, right? I, I feel like that's a fact. And so recently, well this week, um, I, we, I'm part of an org that did like a, a recent trip to Guatemala and we were building with Mesoamerican activists and one of our drivers as well as other activists um, passed away in a car accident recently. And so I think, like, how do you hold that the real dangers, like people's lives are on the line when we do build transnational solidarity? So how do you hold that responsibly and, account and accountable without moving from a place of fear? Um, and then my last question is, uh, what are examples of cross-border solidarity, um, specifically between like the Caribbean and the global north? Thanks for all of those questions, which are all amazing and important questions. Um, I mean, I'm definitely <clears throat> um, 
mindful of colorism in, in my own life and family, obviously, right? Um, that my experiences are very different from my mother's, from other people in my family. Um, and people, my brother sat me down at a very young age to be like, yeah, don't, one, don't be play, don't, don't play their game, don't be played, and also your experience is different and where you're just gonna have to learn how to navigate all of those things at the same time, right? So I think, um, and when I, at the beginning of Invisible No More, I sort of talk about the ways in which I struggle with that in my own work and sort of how, how what spaces I take, where I'm talking from a place of allyship, of solidarity, of meanings around blackness and, and, and co-struggler and um, liberation. But I think that that's a struggle that we all need to um, engage, not just folks who might be, you know, super light-skinned or white-passing, because I feel like all of us are on a spectrum around colorism as well, right, and need to um, navigate that, and it's one of those continuums that we also have to follow to its conclusion in our work and recognize not only how that plays out in policing, but in every aspect of society as part of our liberation. Um, in terms of the second question, well, actually, do you want to talk about that one while I think about the second question? Okay. Yeah. Um. I mean, I think that we always, it's one of those things that often gets pushed to the sidelines is addressing that issue uh, of colorism within community, within, within community, right? That we know is longstanding that, you know, even in, in the Caribbean, that's something that's very, that's very present. Like it's something that still manifests both within our communities and in the different ways, like as you pointed out, that we are treated um, by, by non-black people, by white people, right? Where somebody who's fair skinned like myself might be read as like less aggressive, like less of those, th those traits that people associate with blackness and people will be like, oh, it's so funny, I can relate to you so easily. And I'm like, that's not that funny. <laughs> that actually speaks to a certain way that you're capable of reading a certain kind of humanity on me that you might not be reading on a, you know, a sister of mine who is a, a darker skinned, right? So I think that we need to be attentive to that. And our movements also need to be attentive in terms of like, for those of us, you know, involved in frontline organizing, like, who do we, who are we, like, who is speaking? Uh, for a particular community, right? How do we make sure to not continually like put, um, sort of do what whiter society would ask us to do, which is like those light-skinned people to the, to, the, to the front in every situation, right? How do we make sure that when we're working in collective situations, for example, that we don't um, do that, right? So I think that those are, I mean, some of the, I feel that we're, we're all still kind of working, at least for me personally, and also with what I see in the movements around me, that we're still kind of trying to grapple with this, but it does, it's something that we can't push to the side in terms of our organizing because we're just only going to recreate, you know, the ways that white supremacy maps itself even into our communities. Um, I mean, I was just thinking of one, I think this is your last question, but I was just thinking of some of the really, you know, really strong movement for reparations coming out of the Caribbean right now because I think that when I think about particularly transnational solidarity um, as somebody in the global north, I think it's important to not do um, that Columbusing thing <laughs> that like white women before us have done within a particular element of, I mean, I wanted to, I'm talking about white feminism in particular, right, of then going to speak for, right? Because there was a certain element of like say Pan-Africanism that was very much this idea of like, we will go help the Africans in a very sort of, you know, civilizing discourse, right? So I think we need to not recreate the notion that we would create the terms of what that solidarity could look like. So I'm thinking too, for example, you know, even a few years before Black Lives Matter erupted onto the scene in North America, there was a march uh, of 50,000 black Brazilian women um, through the capitals, right? So it's more like how can we support those movements that are already identifying what they see as the harms and what does that transnationality, what does solidarity demand of us, right? Rather than like how do we make a solidarity for or with somebody else. So I'm thinking also about what that means in terms of, you know, these huge reparation demands coming out of the Caribbean uh, in terms of actually asking, say, like Britain to forgive the debt of Caribbean nations because that debt is, of course, extracted through slavery and is keeping black people impoverished who are made impoverished by that empire. So how do we think about what it would mean to put hold our governments in the global north accountable to what's being asked sort of by our Caribbean um, uh, kin, right? So those are a few answers to a few of the questions. I think I missed the second one. The second one was about, I think, uh, was related, is about sort of um, being mindful that even as we're sort of talking about how bad things are for black folks here, <laughs> that we're not, that we're being mindful of like the state violence plays out differently in different countries. And I, and I think um, it's a similar question in terms of, again, being on a line of privilege. I, and I, you know, I remember we went, I was at Howard, we went to Cuba 
for a you know educational trip, and um, <laughs> Cuban black folks were like telling black folks from the U.S. from Howard that they weren't black, and they were like <laughs> they were not having it. It was like a really intense moment. But I think what they were trying to say is you are from the global north, <laughs> and you have a certain kind of privilege that you like. It's not our we don't have a shared experience of blackness, even though our skin might be the same because of, of the global north. And I do feel like we sometimes in our solidarity um, efforts are trying to be like my brother, my sister, my sibling, my kin, in a way that erases all that, that papers over that. So it might not even be like a Liberia, kind of we're gonna go back to Africa and recolonize, but it might still be a bit of a colonization of an experience that doesn't recognize the privileges of black folks in the global north. Um, and at the same time, you know, activists in Ferguson are dying in a way that might be similar to activists in Guatemala dying, right? So I think that we need to find the ways to talk about those things in nuanced ways, the similarities, but also the privileges we hold, even as the darkest skinned black person living in the global north, right? Um, among any, and, the, and again, we're talking intersectionally, so there's many ways in which we experience privilege and um, not privilege in, from many different angles. Um, and then in terms of the Caribbean solidarity piece, I mean, I'll just never forget during Katrina when like Jamaica was sending aid to New Orleans, right? And was saying, clearly our kin need help, <laughs> right? Um, and sort of this notion that um, it's what Robin was saying, like solidarity is not like us going to somewhere to be in solidarity, it is genuinely finding solidarity in the, in the middle somewhere and not having it always assume that solidarity means us going on a Vence Ramos brigade to there, um, but that it, it's a two-way street and one in which we might meet in the middle. Um, I think there's also a lot of um, solidarity among domestic workers. Um, between the Caribbean and domestic workers here, obviously because as Robin was saying, often we are kin, often it literally is our cousins um, organizing across borders together. Um, so those are some examples I've heard of. Uh, thank you both so much for the conversation tonight. Um, as a fellow, base, a fellow Toronto based Canadian, this was especially meaningful and insightful for me. Um, and just to jump on the, the thread of institutional violence and institutional integration, I was wondering about what your thoughts are on the presence and or really absence of Canadian studies, Black Canadian studies, ethnic studies, or even North American studies in higher education, academia, in Canada, um, the particular challenges that these programs face in Canada, and how do you envision the growth of these programs in Canadian academia? That is a great question to which I would say, what programs, <laughs> which I joke, but not quite. Um, I mean, in the last few years, when, I, when the book was published, I mentioned that there was no black studies program <laughs> in the absence of one minor at Dalhousie, and now there's like a black studies certificate at one university in Toronto, at York. But I mean, what black studies, right? Because we look to, not only is there not, you know, black studies really as a department, as a focus within Canadian universities, but if you look to a history department, like even at the University of Toronto, there's no, for example, professor teaching black Canadian history. Um, similarly, you know, there's one, um, Charmaine Nelson teaches the history of slavery in, art, in an art history program um, at McGill, and that's like the only place in that university that you can learn that slavery even existed in that country, at least when I was there, right? So I think that what we, you know what I was speaking to in terms of the erasure and the absenting of black presence totally from Canadian schooling, that's something that is starting to change so like slightly now, I think because of you know the activism of groups like Black Lives Matter Toronto, the generational struggles of black communities to try to bring some black-centered content. For example, in Nova Scotia, we're starting to see some changes there. Um, but this is one of those things, you know, where I think about cross-fertilization, where a lot of, um, you know, black studies in the United States, for example, like people really had to fight and they occupied spaces for that and that was a very serious struggle and I sometimes, not to, you know, not to plant any particular seeds, but I do think that sometimes we need to remember that um, institutions are not going to give us uh, what we need in order to liberate ourselves. It's always going to be something that we actually have to struggle for and actually, you know, make and take and make space for and demand space for. So I do think that you know, given that particularly like this, the really low percentage of black people in Canadian, in Canadian society, but the extremely high rates of state violence, I think that speaks to a responsibility not only of like, of, of course, black communities who've been fighting for this since, for generations, but also for, you know, instructors more broadly to really actually commit to finally uh, changing 
uh, something towards this end because you know, even in my own education, I didn't learn that slavery existed in Canada, even existed, right, in any institution, even throughout having completed a bachelor's degree. So that's something that is so negligent and purposefully negligent. And I mean, we spoke to the sort of particular harms of that particular kind of erasure. So I do think that wherever we see black studies initiatives prop up, we really need to throw our support um, that way. But as we know, you know, uh, people that are getting their PhDs in Canada, black people that are getting their PhDs are either not working and you can like read their, th their dissertation um, and that is all, uh, or, but they're, they're not getting published and they're not getting work. So I think that just speaks to just another kind, I mean, as you pointed out, of a certain kind of institutional erasure of, of black Canadian uh, resistance and voices and, and brilliance, right? That's still being sort of ignored and stepped over. Or they're coming here. So I mean, I or think coming here. both times I came here was in search of blackness, like in education. Basically, um, you know, when I came for undergrad, um, it was because I went to visit the Canadian schools and was just nothing, I was like, I don't wanna study here. And then I came, I don't know how, but I hitchhiked down to Ithaca and was at Cornell. I, I know, don't ask me why that was where I chose to go, but <laughs> I walked onto the campus one day and there was an occupation um, in favor of divestment from South Africa, of the institution's money from South Africa, and I was like, well, clearly this is the school I'm supposed to go to, right? And that was where I learned about Africana studies being and lived in, an, in a, a dorm that was claimed through armed struggle and studied in an apartment that was claimed through armed struggle. And then when I was thinking about where to come to law school, again, I went, I went to the, applied to the Canadian schools, got in, and was like, I can't learn about the law through a lens that erases the role of anti-blackness, like the deep entrenchment of anti-blackness in the law. So with all the things that Howard is and isn't, at least there we didn't have to talk about the law as a liberatory thing. <laughs> like it was clear that it was written by, the Constitution was written by slaveholders and we're gonna start from there. And at least that was an opportunity that I could have here. And I now know that many people, um, many scholars, as you see, we Canadian scholars are, hide, are popping up everywhere because, and I think black Canadian scholars are coming here for those reasons. So I think if there's opportunities for institutions like Barnard to do partnerships to support a black studies department at University of Toronto, then that's something that we should be pursuing as part of this cross-border solidarity so that more of us aren't like, well, we want to have blackness in education, we have to go to the U.S. Um, whoa, that was a lot. Um, I just want to thank you guys for coming here. It was a great way to end a Thursday. Um, I also want to thank you guys for bringing up the um, the subject of indigenous and black discourse and solidarity, and I feel like that's something that we in the United States can learn a lot about from Canada as well, and how uh, that discourse is um, playing out there, that we need to definitely try to do that here as well. Um, but I also want to know if in your book and in your writings and in your discourse, um, uh, how do you deal with or do you deal with um, African indigeneity? And um, why is, like I feel like um, if we are not talking about this, it can make it more difficult for people to understand uh, settler colonialism here. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess that's my first question. And I have another question, and I think it kind of goes off of something that was previously said, which is, do you also deal with or talk about or discuss the way um, African, Caribbean, and Afro-Latino immigrants can also um, play a part in, um, in settler colonialism, but also in kind of weaponizing their immigrant identity against um, black folk who have been in the US. And I think as somebody who is um, also from an immigrant background, a lot of us have stories like that. So if you could speak on that, that would be great. Uh, sure. Um, actually, you start. Oh, OK. Yeah, those are both really good questions. And I think they're important. Um, this idea of African indigeneity, I think, is something that's important to remember um, 
you know, the fact that settler colonialism is an ongoing reality in Canada does not, you know, take away from the fact that, you know, countries like South Africa, <laughs> like that settler colonialism was also something that was enacted violently on black people and that African peoples were and, you know, are indigenous to those lands. Um, speaking to the diaspora, um, Ronaldo Walcott uh, writes that, you know, his indigeneity was stolen from him and left at the bottom of the ocean, right? Because that's what it means to have been enslaved and had your culture taken away <laughs> and co and fully lost, you know, access to, to those languages the way that enslaved peoples were, that, that that breach that was, you know, the Middle Passage was in some ways like a theft um, of indigeneity. But I do think that you're right that when we, when we speak about indigeneity as if it only exists to these lands, then we're sometimes missing something in particular. But what I do not want to, do though, like what I think sometimes happens within some migrant justice circles is to sort of say that everyone's indigenous to somewhere in this way that erases what I really do see as a very real responsibility to um, not, without getting into the sort of dispute as to whether or not black people can be settlers, because I don't find it a productive one, but what does it mean regardless to sort of focus and energy in terms of trying to become uh, an ideal subject without interrupting settler colonialism as it's still causing people to, to literally die, uh, right? I'm thinking about Katina Fontaine and Colton Bushy in the prairies, for instance, right? That these are really issues that we just have to be accountable to anywhere, right? So when black people also went to, you know, this is that we are not immune to any kinds of sort of um, violence just by virtue of, you know, our, our experience of you know, the legacy of slave trade, I guess. So I just think that that responsibility is, is necessary regardless. Um, what was the last question? Uh, so the last question was kind of on um, the way immigrants themselves, because I know that we talk a lot about the identity of immigrants, um, kind of the traditional um, uh, identity that's not fully accepted, but how is that identity used and recognized? anti-black ways. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's real, right? I think it speaks to like a broader, like the immigrant version of respectability politics in some way where like there's even amongst black communities, there's still that tendency to be like, oh, but we're not like those ones, right? And sometimes that goes along class lines and sometimes that goes around things like what's seen as deviant behavior, like involvement in the sex trade or involvement in drug use or, <laughs> either being like a non-immigrant or immigrant black person, right? For example, like I'm thinking about like Canadian born black people that talk about Jamaicans. Like I do think that there is this sort of just way that um, we continue to distance ourselves from people in our own communities. But uh, I love thinking about what Dorothy Roberts uh, speaks about this when she says that our, um, our, uh, our blackness places us outside the bounds of respectability, right? Which sort of reminds us that as we try to distance ourselves from certain kinds of understandings that we have of blackness that are read, at de read as deviant, like we're, all we're doing is really leaving people that are more on the margins undefended while never actually being able to like position ourselves up and outside of that, right? And I think that, you know, that Norbisi Philip quote that I had mentioned about those black migrants that were, those black immigrants that were trying, right, to distance themselves for, not, she doesn't necessarily say to distance, but trying to create a certain kind of like middle-class Canadian life, realize that that's not allowed regardless, right? So how do we instead like choose who to be in solidarity with? And I think that that really speaks to moving beyond that certain kind of respectability, whether it comes through sort of immigrant narratives or other kinds of other kinds of narratives, right, in which we sort of tell ourselves that story that maybe if we act differently from another kind of black person, like you know, or kind of behavior, that we will somehow escape what it means to be, um, you know, read as black in a particular kind of society. So, in a white supremacist anti-black society, to be clear. I mean, I think the way I try and address um, this question of indigeneity <clears throat> is by starting both Invisible No More and Queer Injustice before 1619, right? Before the 400 year anniversary of the landing at Jamestown of the first African woman, right? Who came in here in chains and slaves. Um, <clears throat> and I try to start with how colonialism played out on the African continent, and I don't touch on it in any great depth, and I'm not a historian, and, I, and, and have a lot of anxiety about when I try and play one in a book chapter. But, um, but really, try and start to be like, to, so that we can draw the parallels, right? It starts with 
what colonialism looked like in terms of indigenous women's experiences here, and then I go back to, and then the colon when the colonizers went to Africa and started grabbing people up, this is how they also projected deviant sexuality onto Africans in Africa, how they projected um, how, how the land theft in Africa played out in gendered ways, et cetera, so that then when both things are juxtaposed on a page, we can see um, colonialism and indigeneity playing out against these different populations in different ways, but we can see enough parallels that we're not saying only indigenous people to this land get to be indigenous, right? Um, so I think that's how I uh, attempt to do it, but I think it's an important um, thing, and I think what, what um, Robin and, and uh, Rinaldo are saying is also important in the sense that we have, you know, what 23andMe, whatever that <laughs> gives you or doesn't give you, we, we have lost the ability to, to claim a relationship to land in a way that is a grief and a loss and a violence of the Middle Passage that we deserve reparations for um, without encroaching on anyone else's sovereignty <laughs> um, or indigeneity as part of that. And, and it's a difficult space to navigate that we have to figure out how to inhabit. Um, and yeah, I mean, I come from an immigrant family where those violences happen all the time and, and as in the ways that Robin's talking about. And it's about resisting those in our families too, right? That's about at the hardest place to be like, you can't say that shit, that's anti-black and what you're saying right now um, is feeding into your own oppression <laughs> in the notion that you could somehow distance yourself through migration. <laughs> yeah. Hi, thank you so much for being here. And I've really enjoyed this discussion and I just stayed here all night talking about these topics. Um, one of the first things I want to address is you make the statement about there not being um, courses in Canada where uh, the discussion centered around blackness and race are non-existent. But here in the United States, universities and colleges are trying to erase those programs out of our institutions because it's, I see it as a way of them trying to silence us. Mm -hmm. And it's very real that we talk about, we have to have these talks <coughs> and the only way we're going to eradicate racism in America is to talk, but the talking is not working. I'm sorry, it's not. And I, something else you brought up about Canadians immigrating to the United States who have PhDs and they're not working? Well, I have a PhD from the New School for Social Research mm -hmm. and I'm not working. And then I think about immigrants, and this is no disrespect to Canadians or uh, immigrants coming from across the border elsewhere, but I think about, well, now I'm competing with immigrants for a space for employment as a, a woman of color with a PhD, and it seems like the goalpost keeps getting pushed further and further and further out. And then how do I reconcile solidarity with my black brothers and sisters across the border when I'm competing against them, you know? And so when I see your title of your book, Policing Black Lives, I attach that title also to Policing Black Lives in the employment space, where if you go on, if I apply for a job and my LinkedIn profile is, um, um, hashtag is on my cover letter or resume, and then you go to my LinkedIn page and you see that I'm a woman of color, I'm being policed by the employer who's now saying, she's got the credentials, but she doesn't look like the image that I see in this job. And this notion of um, there being an unconscious bias, it's bullshit, I'm sorry. There's no unconscious bias when you see someone who doesn't look like the person you imagine being in a job. And I've applied for multiple academic um, tenure track jobs at this institution. And I did not get a job that I know I was qualified for, but when I went back to see the person who did get the job, she didn't look like me, she looked like you. Mm. Another white person, young girl in this room, 
but her credentials were identical to mine. So, you know, this notion of we need to talk and come together, it's not my fault. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah, I don't think either of us are saying that talking is the answer. I think we're talking about creating, uh, about struggling together um, across a border. And I think that what, um, that, that people who are experiencing those privileges need to do is to um, find ways to, to struggle together, right? So I, for, I, there's many examples, I wouldn't, this is not a huge one, but um, the year that affirmative action, I got into, law school in Berkeley the year that affirmative action was withdrawn, um, that they, they struck it down. And they, so I asked them how many black students are in the class now in this post affirmative action, they said, well, there's you. And I was like, no, you don't get to count me in that situation, so I'm not coming. Because <laughs> you don't get to count someone as light skinned as me, as a black person in your post affirmative action world, bye, <laughs> right? And also I would rather learn at Howard where we're gonna have this other conversation. And I do feel like that's, uh, a way in which we can be in, in solidarity with each other and um, uh, navigate these questions of colorism and privilege within our communities um, uh, through a place of, of um, integrity. And um, I think it's also about what Robin was saying, is not fighting for the crumbs that they're giving us and seeing ourselves in competition with each other over a system of tenure track positions that's bullshit. Um, across the border <laughs> um, and find ways to blow it open or build new spaces um, that create possibilities um, across both borders and in both places. I think is what this, this notion of black fugitivity um, and cross-border solidarity that you're offering makes possible. Yeah, and the only thing I would add, I think, is thinking back to not, I guess, what black studies has become institutionally, but what the promise of it was and what the promise of it extended is something that I believe that we really need to continue to fight for, which was not only about having like eight black professors or having you know, a particular sort of number of you know, black scholars, but it was also about democratizing education. It was about allowing black students to be educated about <laughs> black history, about black culture, to produce black knowledge, and that included you know, dreams that went well beyond like a particular kind of ivory tower, right? Like what would it mean to reimagine and refight for black studies as, you know, not only a certain institutional discipline, but actually bringing, you know, democratizing education well outside of the universities, thinking to, you know, in Toronto neighborhoods like Jane and Finch and Montreal neighborhoods like Montreal, where there are large black populations that are not necessarily due to, you know, extreme economic violence having access to that university education. How do we re, how do we really rethink about education much more broadly than, I think, of course, it's really important that we don't eliminate the, the you know, the tiny crumbs that we have remaining of like racial and ethnic and black studies departments, but how do we fight for something that's much, much beyond that, right? So how do we make sure that we don't let our dreams be sort of conscripted to these tiny pieces that they've allowed us and think about that as freedom and how do we think about freedom in a much broader way? And as you mentioned, it has never only been talking that has made that possible. Historically, we've never won anything by talking to you know, those in positions of power and convincing them to shift that. So what that struggle looks like, I think, we don't have that roadmap always drawn at this particular moment, but that is also a struggle that is ongoing and that particularly in these times, I think we will see, we will make, you know, we will all make different choices, but we are going to see it, you know, different kinds of resistance that are going to be necessary if we want the people that we care about to be able to live and survive and thrive in, in a future that is otherwise looking very difficult. And I just want everyone to join me in um, thanking you both so much for a really rich discussion. Thank you.